by myself in my prison cell, it's just me and four dirty walls around me. And I, I sat there thinking, oh my gosh, I'm looking at 25 years to life, but I'm innocent in this. I'm innocent in this and I'm gonna do 25 years to life? You gotta be kidding me. Is there a way around this? Are you sure? There has to be another way around this. Just the other day, I had a friend of mine stop me in the hallway of our church and tell me that they had won a drawing in a contest that they had entered. And the prize was a weekend in Hawaii, the island of Hawaii. That's where my wife and I went on our honeymoon a lot of years ago. That's a great vacation spot. Uh, my wife and I have a, a beautiful time every time we go to the island of Bermuda. In the, in the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of North Carolina. That's another beautiful island. But I wanna to talk to you today about, outside of heaven, the most wonderful place to visit in the entire universe. And it's called the Throne of Grace. It's a spiritual place. It's not a location uh, geographically that you can visit, but the promises concerning the Throne of Grace are so immense that they, it's beyond belief almost. God has so much to say about the throne of grace and what will happen in our lives to change them for the better, provide for needs in our family, finances spiritually, just all kinds of wonderful things happen at the throne of grace. We read about the throne of grace among other places in the book of Hebrews. Let me read to you in chapter four, Hebrews verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. And here's now the key verse. Let us then approach the throne of grace, with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Listen to that again. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. From the very beginning of scripture, over and over God is calling his creation to talk to him in something that we all know of as prayer. In fact, the first people who ever belonged to God were not called Christians and they weren't called Israelites. No, way back in Genesis chapter four, the Bible says that then men and women began to call on the name of the Lord some instinct came into them. There were no scriptures to go by, no promises in God's word as we call it, but some instinct came into their hearts that the same God who had created the world that they were living in and had created them, that same God was not distant and far away, but he was close to them. Although he was not visible to their natural eyes, he could be reached by something that we call prayer. And they began to call on God. Maybe it was a baby got sick or harvesting was not going well and rains were scarce. And they began to call up and out to God and say, God, help us. Help us with that sick child. Help us with our meager crops that we need so badly. And they found out that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, who talk to him and ask him to help them, whatever the problem might be. And so I'm bathing the kids and then all of a sudden, I hear like a knock on the door. So I go to the door and I look through the peak hole and there was this man behind the door and he was dressed like a postal man. And he had a package in his hand and he was like, 
are you Shereen Davis? And I go, yeah. He go, we have a package for you. And on the top of the package, it said ceramica, which meant ceramic in Spanish. Um, and my boyfriend was Spanish. So I'm like, oh, okay, maybe this is his. I said, I didn't order anything. So I took the package and I put the package on the table. And then I went to proceed into uh, bathing my children. Now I turn the water back on again and I'm hearing this banging, but the banging now is like more forceful. And it's like someone's trying to break in now. And so I turn the water off again, I go to the door, and I thought it was the postal man again, so I kind of opened it up a little bit again the way I did. And all of a sudden, all of these cops just came bombarding through my door, guns in my face, and they were like, put your hands up, put your hands up. Now my boyfriend comes out, because they go back in there and they get him. And so now he comes out, his hands are up now, and they're like, do you have any more drugs in this place, in your apartment? And I go, do we have drugs here? And I'm kind of afraid, because I don't know what to expect. And so they're going in his bag, they're pulling out all his stuff, and they go, ha! Huh. So in the bottom of the bag, they find another key of cocaine. And in the bag was $65,000. So he's standing there, he's not even saying anything. He's not trying to say, okay, uh, she had nothing to do with it. Uh, she, she knows nothing about this. But they're looking at me like, you knew what was going on. And I'm like, I had no idea. And, you know, I'm sitting there in Central Booking and, and everything is happening around me, you know. They told my lawyer what, what took place, what they found, um, how the whole event, you know, transpired. And he goes, well, so this is what's going to happen. The package came in your name and that was your apartment. You're looking at 25 years to life. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. 25 years to life? What's gonna happen to my kids? Who's gonna, have, who's gonna take care of my girls? But I'm innocent in this. I'm innocent in this and I'm gonna do 25 years to life? You gotta be kidding me. Is there a way around this? Are you sure? There has to be another way around this. You know, I stood in front of the judge and she, you know, you look at her doing cases before yours, before your case comes up, and she looked like she was a hard judge. She was like setting the hammer down. And so I was shaking. So now the prosecutor, you know, he gives his version of the story. He made me look like I was this big drug, drug pin, and I had been flinging drugs like all my life. And I'm looking at him and I'm saying to myself, is he talking about me? So he said what he had to say. My, my defense lawyer said what he had to say. And the judge looked at, she looked at me, and she was like, she slammed down on the gavel. She said, I'm setting bail at $1 million. I was like, I'm never gonna get out of here. I don't have $1 million. I, so, I go back to my cell. Now I'm back in my cell. The main thing that was on my mind was my girls, my special needs daughter, I'm thinking about this guy, how he didn't exonerate me, how he didn't speak up for me, he didn't say I had nothing to do with it. And I was saying, I'm in this by myself. What happened was while I was sitting there thinking, I thought about the church that I was going to and the church that my family was going to. And I thought about what came to me was the, the messages that were saying that Jesus loved me. And I started talking to Jesus. I didn't know how to pray. But I just started pouring out my heart to God. All the way through the Old Testament, we find that those who call upon the name of the Lord were answered by a God who has an ear that is never shut to our prayers. In fact, we find out that some of the most wicked people in the entire Old Testament, wicked kings like King Manasseh, who at the very worst time in their lives, when they were suffering uh, the reaping of what they had sown, they somehow reached up to God and said, God, help me or have mercy. And that loving God responded and answered their call. Now we get to the New Testament, and now we have a different whole scenario before us. For Moses gave us the law, but in the New Testament, we find out that God's ultimate plan for mankind, womankind, for all of us came into being. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. 
So we now find out that God's love reached beyond our sin, our shortcomings, even our rebellions, as in my case. I grew up in a church, knew about the Lord, but I didn't want him in my life. I didn't want him running my life. I didn't want to serve God. I wanted to serve Jim Cimbala. But God broke me and melted my heart when I realized his love for me. And I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And that's how you become a Christian. You confess your sins, your disobedience to God, and you put your faith in Jesus Christ as the atoning substitute for us. When he died on the cross, he bore your sins and my sins so that we could be forgiven, shown mercy, and now have a destination for all eternity called heaven, a place where we'll be with him. But there's more, and that, that brings us to the throne of grace. God doesn't just save us, bring us into his family, and then say, by the way, good luck the rest of your life, and I hope to meet you at the end of it when I bring you to heaven, when you die or Christ returns. No, God loves us so much that after giving us his son as our savior, he now provides through Jesus Christ a place where we can go continually, every day. Sometimes the pressures of life make us visit there every hour. It's called the throne of grace, and it's a place where we can go with our problems, our difficulties, our heartbrokenness, and bring it to God and see how God will lovingly respond to us and help us make it through that valley. Get over that mountain that seems insurmountable. And that's what this passage is about. Jesus Christ is not only our savior, he's our high priest. He's the one that connects us to God the Father and brings us into the presence of God in a way where we can have confidence. You know, in the Old Testament, people couldn't approach God just like we can today. The high priest, one day of the year on the Day of Atonement could go into the Holy of Holies and, and have a, a dialogue with God and experience his presence. But through Jesus Christ, you and I now, your study group, your church, all of us as children of God can approach God with confidence. He doesn't see our sins. They've been washed away through the blood of Jesus Christ. And this same God who gave us his son is so anxious to help us with what we're facing. And I just started pouring out my heart to God. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry for disappointing you, but I need your help because I'm in a mess and I don't know how to get myself out of it. I remember back when I was in church, they said that you loved me and for right now, you're the only person that I could talk to. Now it's time to go back in front of the judge and I didn't know what was gonna happen. And so I stood in front of the judge, same judge. I had my hands behind my back and I looked up at her, and she looked at me differently. And I didn't understand why, but she looked at me differently. And it was just like, her demeanor got a little bit more tender towards me, and her eyes got a little more softer towards me. The prosecutor again, he said what he had to say, and my, my lawyer said what he had to say. And I just looked at her like this, and I remember her sitting up in her chair, and she leaned over to lean over to the, to the desk and she said, I don't know why I'm doing this, but I'm gonna let you out on your own reconnaissance today. And it's at that time, right when she said that, that I knew God heard me and I knew God was listening to me. And I knew that God had, he gave me so much mercy. At that time, I knew that I was speaking to a God that was living and he was listening to me. And so I got out of prison that day. And that was only the mercy of God. That was only the mercy of God. And I am so thankful and so grateful that he extended that mercy towards me because I had nowhere else to turn but to Jesus. And that's what I did. I've been in the ministry a number of decades and I can't tell you all the situations that God has brought me through, supplied 
at one time $6 million in the space of 10 minutes, a gift of $1 million and a gift of $5 million, just when our church was in a huge construction project, and that's exactly what we needed, $6 million. That burden was overwhelming me, it was. I was in South America in the country of Argentina, and I had just learned before I went there that we were short six million dollars. That number got my attention, as I'm sure it would have gotten your attention. And what to do? I began to worry. I began to fret. I told my wife, I'm going out for a walk. And I knew where I wanted to go. It wasn't a physical destination, although the city I was in, Mar del Plata in Argentina, is a beautiful coastal city, a resort city for Argentines. No, I was going to walk and I was gonna get my heart to a place called the throne of grace. And I poured out my burden to the Lord, just like the, the passage we just read in scripture says, come boldly to the throne of grace. This is where God wants to help you with mercy and grace. This is the, this is the access we have through Jesus Christ. We can go to almighty God instead of carrying the burden ourselves, like I was, six million dollars. I started to second guess myself. What, what am I thinking about? Why am I in Argentine, Argentina feeding people, pastors, and ministering to them? I should be home saving money and contacting wealthy people because we're $6 million short on this first stage of our building project. But I didn't know any wealthy people. But I had a God who I knew owns the cattle on a thousand hills, as the Bible says. So I brought my need to him and I walked and I wept. And yes, I cried. And I, you know, some prayers are, 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 can hardly be verbalized. But I gave God my burden and I said, God, what do I do? I, this is too big for me. But, but yet you led us this far. The other pastors that work with me, we all felt peace about taking this big step and entering this project. I want you to know that at the throne of grace, I received a peace that God somehow had heard me and that he was gonna take care of this problem and act on our behalf. As God is my witness, I returned to New York after a 10 hour flight overnight from Buenos Aires, went into the office to catch up on all this mail and these uh, phone messages I had, emails. And as I was going through it, at 12 noon, I opened a letter which was from a man in Chicago. And he said, you know what? God used your ministry uh, and, the, and the music from your church to touch my heart and save me from making a very bad decision. I want to give you a million dollars. From someone who I had met once, I wouldn't have known him if he walked into my office. 10 minutes later, after celebrating and thanking God for that gift, I opened another letter from a woman uh, who I have never met to this day. And she just simply wrote, our foundation has learned you're in a project and I want you to know we want to make a gift of five million. Isn't that amazing? One plus five equals six, uh, no matter what country you live in. And that's the exact amount that we needed. And where did it come from? Not my cleverness, not my struggling, but giving it to God, bringing it to the throne of grace. And this is what God is saying to all of us today. Call upon me and I will answer you. You and I must understand the same God that gave us his son to die on a cross and suffer for us how would he not help us now with the problems we're facing? You might have a wayward daughter, a wayward son. Uh, you might be a pastor and, and, and your church is not flourishing like you know God wants it to. What to do? Worry, fret, get depressed, call everybody and complain, get into a victim mentality. All of that is a dead end. What God wants us to do is come with confidence, not because we deserve an answer, not because I, Jim Cimbala, can come into his presence. No, I've sinned way too many times. I'm not worthy for God to answer my prayers, but I can come in the name of Jesus Christ. I can enter into that 
place of prayer, the throne of grace. You know what grace means? God doing for us what we don't deserve. Grace has many meanings, but I want you to focus on that meaning. At the throne of grace, God gives us what we don't deserve. He gives us things that we need because of his nature, not because of our track record. So I want to say to you today, as we, as we do this first session together, God is waiting for you. God is not saying what I heard growing up in church, which was, come on, Jim, pray, pray. That's what I grew up around. Maybe you have a similar experience. Pray, why? Because Christians pray, you better pray. If you don't pray, you know, you're on the wrong side of God. He's going to be angry with you. No, that's not it at all. What God is saying to us is come and pray. Talk to me and tell me as if I don't even know what you're going through. That's a very important thing to, to remember. Bring your petition and tell God exactly what you're facing. We're not at a throne of judgment. We're coming to a throne of grace. We don't have an angry judge like God here in this situation. We have our Father, which art in heaven, who's waiting at the throne of grace. And you and I will find as we visit there that we will get the answers that we so sorely need. Prayer gets answers from God. Do you need answers from God? Do you need a supply from God? I want to tell you one last thing here. The only day you can pray is today. You can't pray yesterday. It's gone. Don't say you'll start to pray tomorrow. The Bible warns us our life is a vapor. We don't know if we'll see tomorrow. But we are alive today. And we can come to God today and he's willing, able, ready, anxious to help us. The worst epitaph that could ever come upon our lives at the end of it is, you had not because you asked not. Imagine over at our church, the Brooklyn Tabernacle, you had not because you asked not. I would have done it for you. I, there's no eternal decree that I didn't want to help you. No, I didn't help you because you didn't ask. You have not because you ask not. But today, I know you and I are gonna go to the throne of grace and we're gonna get all the answers and supplies that our loving Father has for us. May we do it today with all of our hearts. My favorite scripture is Jeremiah 29, 11. And God says in his word, he says, if I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. And he said, it's a plan to prosper you and not to harm you. A plan to give you hope and a future. And that scripture helps me because um, when I didn't have a plan for my life, and when I didn't have any hope, and when everything around me seemed like it was harming me, God reminds me that he has a great plan for my life. And it is not to harm me, but it is to prosper. He's just been so faithful in my life. He's given me tremendous blessings. 